Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, uh, session, which is entitled Creativo. The Swiss advancement that a diabetic patient is waiting for is 1.30. I'm Swiss, so I want to get this session started right on time. These are my disclosures. So this is the agenda uh, for today. Uh, I will be playing the role of the anchor person in the new PCR terminology. I, get you, I guess you are getting familiar with that. We will leverage as a moderator Robert Byrne from Highland, who hopefully will join us uh, soon. Uh, we'll have the privilege to have as a discussant as well as speaker Rafael Romaguera, uh, Rosley from Malaysia, and uh, Antonio Colombo is going to share his huge experience with us. And also, please don't be shy, uh, chat as much as you can with us. We will, of course, try to bring in all your burning questions into the live discussion, but also Edesh Istvan is gonna do his very best here with us on stage to reply to all questions, not only the one who are gonna be answered by us, but also the other one. This is the flow. Uh, it's a nice mix between case, cases and actually for frontal uh, lecture. We're gonna kick off with Rosalie, who is very known to all of you, is a great operator, is gonna uh, present a very interesting case, very interesting case, which will lead to a huge amount of discussion. Robert Byrne will then uh, show in, with a deep dive uh, the technology. And then finally we close with the Rafael Romaguera, who is gonna not only present the data which were presented early last year and simultaneously published, but Rafael promised me just right now, five minutes ago, that he would present new data just for us. So with that said, it's my privilege to call upon Rosalie for the first case. I'm launching already your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for being uh, in the session uh, because a lot of us actually prepared for this. And uh, welcome back to uh, EuroPCR. So I'm going to start off, and I don't have any conflicts of interest, uh, with a case that would uh, hopefully set uh, the stage uh, for subsequent discussions and presentation. So this is a 57-year-old gentleman who was uh, first seen in July of 2019. He has uh, had a PCI in 2011 to the mid-LED. And this time around, he came in with symptoms of congestive heart failure over a short period of time, and he was in functional class four. He had an angiogram that was done, and this showed severely calcified lesions uh, or vessels, and there was severely uh, uh, stenotic uh, lesion in the uh, left main and tree vessel disease. He was offered uh, to have bypass surgery, but he flatly refused at that point in time, and my colleague from another hospital referred the patient to me. He was a diabetic for the last, well, he is a diabetic uh, for the last 15 years. Uh, and his diabetes is not well controlled, HbA1c of 9.5, a hypertensive, and has hand stage renal disease on, on hemodialysis. And this was regularly performed three times a week. When I first saw him, he was in congestive heart failure, blood pressure of 187. He underwent hemodialysis, uh, and he improved uh, much, and he was much better after dialysis. We did a pre procedural PCI, and his LV function was only 35%. There was hypokinesia seen in the LED territory, but it was still viable. At least there was contraction in that area. This is his ECG. He was in sinus rhythm. You can see poor outward progression, and this indicated a previous uh, anterior MI. Otherwise, um, it was quite okay. Now this is the images uh, of, I hope it uh, turns out well, you can see some calcification clearly seen in the LED and uh, circumflex, and you can see stenosis uh, particularly in the ostial LED and uh, ostial circumflex. This is again one, another view, uh, apicranal view to show calcification LED, left main and uh, also circumflex. There was a stent in a mid LED, the stent struts, and there was a significant or severe stenosis uh, proximal to the stent. Another view, and uh, the spider view clearly shows the uh, complexity of the lesion in the distal left main and ostial LED. And this is the right. The right is also severely calcified, and there was um, mid-segment RCA stenosis. Yeah, I mean, we took again to ensure that he really didn't want surgery, and he was not uh, agreeable to surgery, and that's the reason why we proceeded to PCI. We first tackled the LED. It was a non-dilatable lesion, a 2.0 at 20 atmospheres. It did not give way. 
So we then rotobladed. This is a seven French guide. So we use a 1.75 mm burr, th uh, three runs in total. And subsequently, we managed to ensure that the balloon was fully expanded uh, at 26 atmospheres. Uh, we then prepared the left main. We treated the circumflex first with the same balloon and uh, subsequently scoring balloon 3.5 left main to LED and you can clearly see that uh, there was still some waste over in the LED. We then uh, took, a, we have to ensure that we expanded the lesion well. We took an OPNNC and went up to 40 atmospheres with a 4.0. And that was the results after. Now we are ready to put in implant the stent. Um, a stent was implanted, uh, a drug looting stent, 3.5 by 12, and then we post dilated high pressure with a non-compliant balloon from 20 to 26, and you can see it's well expanded. Uh, we treated the left main stem with a 4.0 by 20 at 14 atmospheres, and you can see that uh, the balloon, uh, well, the balloon looks uh, fully expanded, and uh, we took in a 4.5 uh, non-compliant. We did not go very high, though I would have wished uh, that we would go much higher because the balloon is actually a bit longer, even though it's 8 mm, and it was jutting slightly outside the stand struts, so the stand was a bit too short. Anyway, uh, we decided to use a TAP in this case, a 3.0, and uh, this was placed uh, just into the main vessel, the left main, and deployed at 16 atmospheres, we pulled back and we went up to 22 atmospheres. So it looks as if the balloon is well expanded and the stand is expanded. And we ended with kissing 4.5 and 3.0. We did not use an intravascular ultrasound because of financial considerations and we were using too many devices, so we had to compromise. Uh, and uh, that was the results after, and uh, we thought that angiographically it looks good and we, did, we, uh, we were quite pleased with the results and went on to treat the right. The right, we went for rotoblator. The first burr went into ventral standstill for about uh, five seconds, and the second rotoblator went in fairly smoothly, and that was then opened with a scoring balloon, results spoon, scoring, scoring balloon, a 3.5 stent, and then post-dilated at high pressures. And that was the results after. So this was the medications upon discharge. It was only on insulin, I think, because of the end-stage disease on uh, dialysis. And uh, we discharged, I discharged him back to the referring cardiologist and did not hear uh, from him until about six months later. And in six months later, he developed, uh, again, congestive heart failure uh, symptoms. Even though he underwent regular hemodialysis, he developed gangrene, uh, clinical limb ischemia, and had to have angioplasty done to the uh, uh, posterior and anterior tibial arteries. And during dialysis, he was noted to have non-sustained VT and also hypotension. And because of that, uh, he was then re-referred. In fact, the LV has function has deteriorated to about 20% and his HbA1c is still not well controlled. Those are some of the uh, anti-pro BMP and uh, cardiac biomarkers. The CKMB and C, uh, CK was not elevated, but the TROP was, TROP was elevated. This is the issue. The only difference, if you can recall, is that now he has tachycardia, and there is, still, there is some ST elevation noted in the anterolateral leads, one AVL, V5, V6, that was not there before. This is the findings. Now, the images shows that uh, if you look at the first above right-sided uh, images, you can see the stand. It looks as if the stand looks quite good expansion. It did not, like, there, there was no like wasting, but you can see severe stenosis in ostium LED, and in particular, the circumflex. This is also seen, uh, both the stand expansion in the uh, spider view and the stenosis. And uh, the mid LED was totally occluded in a proximal part of the proximal stem. So that's a total occlusion. The right was also showing the same thing. There was uh, significant stenosis in the mid uh, right, and uh, you know the stem was uh, looks as if it is quite well expanded from the, uh, the from the fluoroscopy images. So this time is different. They wanted to think about it. We discussed with the surgeons. The surgeons felt that there was underfilling of the, the mid and distal right, even though it was, to me, it was diffusely diseased and small. So he felt that, yes, it can be done. So the patients and family were being concerned that after six months it came back, they wanted something that would probably give a much longer, better result. So they were agreeable for bypass surgery. So 
Uh, and to summarize this case, uh, we can see that uh, progression of disease, I feel, is multifactorial, especially in diabetes, it's not controlled. And you can see that in diabetes with co-morbids, uh, like uh, especially with end disease and uh, hemodialysis, the risk of aggressive uh, restenosis is going to be much higher, whatever treatment therapy that you want to decide, whether PCI or with cabbage. And this is also seen by the development of the critical limb ischemia and deterioration of LV function. Could I have done better? Obviously, the technique can also be discussed. But uh, imaging, one might say, is very important uh, in this case. We can discuss whether that would have made any difference. Uh, but of course, when I look back, I would say that it, will, it might have made some difference. And the question would be, now that we have uh, you know, uh, stents, newer stents, the question will be, if a stent which is better suited for diabetes, would, have, would it have made a difference? And that, I hope, will set the stage for subsequent presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rosalie. We tend to present the good cases that Congress is. I think you have been very brave and presented a not so good case. So let's get into the discussion of this case. Antonio, you are the expert, and Rosalie was already calling upon a comment. He did not use FFR selection of lesion. He did not use intravascular imaging modalities. Would that allowed aim to have reached a better job in this specific case and perhaps whether you can talk the usefulness of these new, tool, or new tools tools in, uh, in uh, interventional cardiology, especially in diabetic patients. In, as much as I consider uh, imaging important, uh, personally I do not believe imaging would have made a difference. Uh, but this is a typical patient uh, where we like to see some uh, new results uh, with some uh, new device, uh, new approach. He's a diabetic, uh, real diabetic, uh, with a diabetic vasculopathy, uh, renal uh, problems. Uh, you, you, you don't need many patients like this to show that something is happening. Uh, in one direction or the other. 20 patients in one group, 20 in the other would be sufficient. And this was a peculiar case, right? Because it was not just diabetes, it was a combination of diabetes, CKD, and also very poorly controlled uh, glycemic control, right? This patient was on <coughs> insulin, perhaps was not even taking insulin, looking at the glycate hemoglobin. So Robert, now then back to you. Uh, we have seen many newer generation uh, DS, polymeric DS, and I like what we see in the last years with respect to the new advancements in uh, medication for diabetic patients. We have not seen one polymeric DS really standing out over the other. Or oh, uh, did I miss something? You are the stent expert here, Robert. Can you help us? Uh, no, I, I think you've uh, summarized uh, that uh, accurately. We have made uh, significant progress with newer generation DES as compared with earlier generation devices. We all know that. We know it from our daily practice. We see it from the patients who come back uh, and see us for follow-up. Uh, we know about the efficacy improvements, and we know also about the safety, safety improvements to such an extent that now the discussion has moved on to the duration of DAPT because we're happy with safety. But uh, I think when you look at treatment interaction with uh, diabetes, you still see that diabetes uh, is an issue and uh, there doesn't seem to be in terms of the poly poly polymeric uh, DES and I'll show it in my presentation a significant difference uh, uh, between uh, polymeric uh, DES in terms of either efficacy or safety. Thank you Robert and indeed uh, Rosalie going back to you you were in a way in a humble approach thank you for taking this approach questioning yourself as an operator but I, I have the feeling that you did an excellent job in expanding the stents it was really an intima hyperplasia issue more than anything else you see the stent perfectly well expanded with this lumen getting narrowed in between so it was not a stent uh, under expansion issue it was an intima hyperplasia issue so do you think we need better uh, stent a more efficacious stent in diabetic patients specifically? I, I believe it's timely because, you know, in Asia Pacific, uh, the amount or number of uh, diabetics is fairly high. In Malaysia itself, uh, we, every PCI that we do, 45% uh, percent of them are diabetics. That's uh, how high it is. So I'm sure it's going to be the same with surgery. So we, I would be happy to have a device that would be much better uh, and give better results in diabetes because we see that there is still a catch-up especially when the diabetes is not well controlled in insulin diabetes. But if you have a device that can actually prevent uh, and, you know, or reduce this number significantly as compared to the regular uh, stents, that would be welcome. Uh, 
Go ahead, Antonio. In your practice, uh, uh, having so many diabetics, what uh, would you guess the MACE rate at one year in your practice of diabetics clinically followed without, uh, okay. what would you quote, one year? Well, I... The death, uh, MI, and revascularization. Yeah. I, I can't really quote as, as such because, uh, you know, we have got about 10% uh, risk of uh, mortality in the national data over one to two years, but this is in all. But I do believe that for diabetes, the risk is much higher. It is not as, you know, as, you know, very high, but still the proportion as compared to diabetics, I feel is a bit higher. Would you say 15%? About 10% at least, at least 10%. Marco, I was just uh, uh, saying, like, in terms of the case that we're discussing, uh, you know, obviously there's a couple of things that matter, and there's a poor substrate, and it's complex lesion morphology, um, but it's it's we all know it's a it's a it's a combination between the technical uh, result and then the potency of the uh, drug uh, eluting stent or drug coated balloon or whatever you're using, and the point I think is that small margins. Uh, can have big uh, gains and uh, it's not a linear relationship and this I think this is important in patients with diabetes it's important in other fields when you're thinking about intervening in restenosis small margins sometimes translate into a big gain so I think that's why uh, as a clinician we see the unmet need in terms of drug eluting stents even though the stents that we have are pretty good absolutely and Robert, then going back to uh, to you, uh, Rafael, uh, I think the data, the randomized control data, have clearly shown that uh, if and when we did the comparison of stenting, even uh, newer generation stenting, with the uh, CABG in diabetic patient, uh, we are we are the second choice. I think the data are, are clear. We could discuss whether that is irrespective of complexity because we have some sort of contrasting data between syntax and other studies. But anyhow, the guidelines are giving a class one A recommendation for surgery, and we are a second option either because of the surgical risk is too high or whatever reason the patient cannot undergo surgery. So, do you more perceive it's a, a stent? efficacy issue or is simply reflecting the different way of revascularizing because CABG of course is not using stent but is bypassing an entire segment so uh, what do you think is important of DES efficacy in this specific role? Thank you Marco. <clears throat> there is an absolute lack of research in patients with diabetes even if they are more than 500 million around the world 30 percent of patients undergoing PCI there is no such data. So in freedom and in syntax, they were tested only the first generation DS. And then we know from Tuxedo that with science, the target vessel failure was improved with science. And now we know from Sugar that with the new DS, even these results can be further improved. But the improvement is mostly in, t in the target lesion, as you said. So probably the new technology could uh, put closer the results. But now we know from FAME 3 that we are improving, but they are also improving. The results from surgery nowadays are much better than when Freedom or Syntax were conducted. So I think that uh, even with the new devices will be, will be different to, to complete the, the, this difference, the catch up, because the results are, are, are getting, getting better. And now we know uh, from Sugar, you know, from the two years follow up, I'm looking that we have a lot of non target vessel revascularizations. And that's already you cannot disclosure, Rafael. <laughs> You're disclosing the data. Be careful. <laughs> I'm looking at a lot of non-target vessel revascularization, so you cannot treat that with a stent. So you can place a stent with a very low rate of target lesion failure, but then the patient will have another event in another point of the vessel. If it's proximal, it's not a problem with surgery or in different vessels. So probably it will be different, dif difficult. Yeah, and I agree. Actually, you would see the same perhaps in even non-diabetic patient. The first year, everything is dominated by what you did, but after the second year, after the first year, then what uh, you left behind, perhaps because it was not critical, is getting into the picture. Adesh, do we have anything burning from the audience that needs to be openly discussed? We have still two minutes. Perhaps we could go to... There was one very interesting question, which was the use of the OPN balloon uh, from a colleague of ours. Uh, in terms of um, using the OPN balloon at very high pressure, so exceeding 35 atmospheres, always to 40. Um, how concerned should we be uh, with uh, major complications, so vessel rupture? Rosely? Okay. Uh, I think one needs to be careful. Of course, uh, the rated burst is, I think, 32 or 35. But you can still go on more. And uh, I've gone to about 45. The most important thing is uh, when you go on after 32, you've got to be very slow. You cannot go like 35, 40, then it will burst. Uh, 
So if you go after 32, then you go slow. Then 32, 34, 36. The chances of bursting is much less. So one needs to understand uh, that there are certain limitations. It's a very good balloon, but of course it can cause rupture, and uh, one just has to be very slow going in it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Marco, much. just with the newer uh, iteration of the balloon, you can go to 55 atmospheres. Oh, so, right. uh, and I would say our experience is generally uh, positive. The balloon is well constrained yes. and um, uh, cautious with the, with, with the pressure buildup. But, um, yeah. Wow. But uh, I think uh, the case presented by Mohamed, uh, it's really something that goes beyond uh, mm. optimal stent implantation. Yes. It's... Uh, it's absolutely. I mean, uh, it's a complex patient more than a complex. If you implant the stand better, you make more room for hyperplasia. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you for this sobering conclusion. Now we move uh, forward to Robert Byrne for uh, his lecture, which is paving the way for an effective PCI in diabetic uh, mellitus patients, Creativo Unique Technologies. So, uh, Marco, thanks very much for the introduction and thanks to the organisers for the invitation to be here and to speak in this interesting uh, symposium, paving the way for an effective PCI and DM uh, patients. Uh, I'm uh, planning to uh, show you over the next uh, eight or nine minutes uh, some uh, thoughts about the mechanism of the Creativo uh, stents. These are my disclosures. Um, so starting off with a little bit uh, of a look at the unmet need, and we covered some of this in the discussion. We know, and we alluded to it already, that uh, diabetes is a growing problem, uh, a very significant increase uh, predicted uh, over the coming uh, 20 to 25 years, uh, affecting uh, Europe probably to a lesser extent and the rest of the world to a greater extent. We know that in terms of uh, treating obstructive coronary lesions with PCI, that uh, actually the newer generation uh, stents showed clear benefit compared with first generation devices uh, in patients who didn't have diabetes, but in patients with diabetes, the benefit uh, was less clear. Uh, we know also that there are a large number of newer generation uh, DES on uh, the market. Uh, some of these platforms have iterated. Uh, but what we know is their performance in patients with uh, diabetes is broadly uh, similar. And the second thing that you note from all of these Kaplan-Meier curves of target lesion failure is this attrition over time, which seems to be more marked in patients who have uh, diabetes. So I think that uh, characterizes to some extent why we think there's an unmet need. Uh, in terms of the uh, pathophysiology at a cellular level, uh, what do we think are the mechanisms at play? Well, uh, the there's a couple of challenges. Uh, one is direct resistance to uh, Lymus drugs, and we know uh, that at a cellular lev level, dysregulation of the mammalian target of uh, rapamycin is involved, and this leads to a uh, pro uh, intimal uh, hyperplastic uh, uh, phenomenon in patients with diabetes compared with those without diabetes. And uh, uh, we know that in order to inhibit it, obviously the Lymus drugs uh, work at the mammalian target of rapamycin, that we need approximately tenfold uh, higher uh, concentrations inside the cell to achieve the same level of inhibition compared with a patient uh, who doesn't have uh, diabetes. The second uh, challenge is to consider the effects of other hormones. About 90% of patients with type 2 diabetes are uh, overweight uh, or obese, and we know that uh, body mass index, independent of diabetes status, is a uh, further marker of adverse outcome. We think that a lot of these adverse effects related to weight are uh, uh, related uh, to the effects of hyperleptinemia. This is a hormone secreted by adipocytes and it has specific vascular effects. Uh, we know that these effects are adverse, promoting angiogenesis, activation of the immune system, uh, leading to a switched on inflammatory response, and uh, pro-atherogenic in terms of plaque uh, progression and also in terms of uh, thrombotic uh, status. Uh, we know also from preclinical tests that uh, an approximately ninefold higher concentration of uh, Lymus drug is necessary to block uh, hyperplasia when it is induced uh, by uh, leptin. So I think for both of these uh, uh, reasons, when we think of uh, the relative uh, resistance to drug and the adverse effects of hyper hyperleptinemia, alternative approaches to, impro uh, to improve uh, PCI e uh, 
outcomes uh, should be focused on increasing Lyme's drug uh, concentration. And like I said earlier, sometimes small margins uh, can deliver uh, big gains. So in terms of the Creativo stent, then two uh, components of the stent technology to discuss over the next couple of minutes. One is the albuminal reservoir uh, technology. It's, uh, this uh, leverages polymer-free drug release uh, system uh, reservoirs, which are on the albuminal uh, side of the stent platform. And it's something we investigated uh, quite a lot in the uh, ESAR stent uh, project uh, in Munich uh, many years ago. Uh, we know that the uh, size and the depth of the uh, reservoirs uh, is uh, intricately linked uh, to uh, drug release and the, gra and the concentration uh, gradient, and that uh, albuminal reservoir technology design is, uh, is critically important when it comes to drug load and also drug release. Uh, uh, there's an important difference between uh, using uh, albuminal, albuminal reservoir technology and polymers to control drug uh, release. The albuminal reservoir technology, of course, allows a mix of substances to be uh, uh, eluted uh, simultaneously, whereas polymers act uh, like a filter and uh, molecules of different size are uh, released at different pace, whereas with albuminal reservoirs, we tend to have a more luminal, uh, a more uh, linear uh, release of uh, molecules regardless of the size. The second component then, Apart from albuminous reservoir technology is the amphilimus uh, formulation. This is a proprietary uh, technology. Uh, it's a combination of uh, serolimus and fatty acids. And uh, this is a formulation that's particularly suited to patients uh, with uh, diabetes for reasons I'll show you in a moment. Uh, so the combination then of the uh, uh, albuminal reservoir technology together with the amphilimus uh, formulation uh, leads to a, uh, a smooth uh, drug release over the first uh, 30, 60, 90 days. One of the things I learned uh, from looking at stents in the early days that it's this drug elution within the first 30 days that's critical. Of course, there's a rapid uh, release in the first 10 days or so, but it's sustained between 10 and 30 days that I think it's critical. And 65 to 70% uh, is, uh, that's a good figure at uh, 30 days. Some other polymer-free drugs, are, uh, stents for example, might have 90% or 95% or, or, or more uh, at 30 days, and I think this underlies uh, suboptimal efficacy. The reason that uh, uh, having a fatty acid uh, uh, carrier makes sense in patients uh, with diabetes is because their ATP generation uh, pathways are switched in a patient who doesn't have diabetes. It's a mix between fatty acids and glucose pathways, and in a patient who has diabetes, it's the fatty acid uh, pathway uh, that's dominant, and the amphilimus formulation then piggybacks on this adverse pathological effect. The limus and the fatty acid uh, combined in an upregulated uh, diabetic cell, which is dependent on fatty acid metabolism for ATP generation, and uh, this uh, facilitates a Trojan horse-like effect to get increased uh, limus drug concentration into the cell. Finally, just to spend a minute then on uh, uh, high bleeding risk uh, patients, because this is something that uh, we hear more and more about in uh, uh, clinical practice, we realize that these make up a, a non-substantial proportion of our patients, maybe up to 45%, depending on uh, what data you look at. If you just concentrate in this slide on the right of the slide, and uh, these are the patients with high bleeding risk, and we know that they probably have a threefold uh, higher bleeding risk than patients who are binary uh, classified as non-high bleeding risk. But what's also become clear from the studies is there's about a two-fold increase in terms of ischemic or thrombotic uh, complications. Uh, patients with uh, diabetes and high bleeding risk, I would argue, have double jeopardy uh, in terms of both efficacy and safety. And we know that uh, diabetes uh, mellitus as comorbidity is very common in patients who are high bleeding risk, accounting for uh, up to 50% uh, of uh, all HBR patients. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about avoiding bleeding, of course, the discussion focuses on uh, shortening the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy, which is important, but arguably uh, the key uh, mechanism to avoid uh, bleeding is to avoid repeat intervention and uh, to uh, reduce uh, bleeding events which are subsequent to antithrombotic therapy around the time of the repeat intervention. This is why an efficacy advantage uh, may also uh, translate into a safety advantage in patients with diabetes. So the take-homes then, uh, despite favorable safety uh, uh, and efficacy outcomes, there's still room for improvement uh, in patients with a 
diabetes mellitus who are undergoing contemporary PCI. Patients are prone to lower efficacy due to this resistance at a cellular level, uh, uh, at an mTOR level, and to high blood levels of leptin. Uh, the Creativo uh, uh, stent then uh, leverages this amphilimus formu formulation together with abluminal reservoirs and uh, allows for increased intracellular level uh, in, at the vascular uh, smooth muscle cell uh, level of uh, the active drug. And finally, the high prevalence of diabetes in patients who are at high bleeding risk uh, and the enhanced efficacy of the Creativo stent in these patients represents an opportunity uh, not just for enhanced efficacy, but also for enhanced safety uh, mediated via reduction in TLR and requirement for repeat DAPT. So with those take home messages, I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you, Robert. Well, meanwhile, you reach your station here for some questions. Let me ask uh, Rosalie, I would kick off from you. So as we heard, diabetes is really prevalent condition in, in uh, Asia. I, I did work there and I was impressed how frequently even very young patients are affected already yeah. with diabetes and what a devastating disease they suffer from already. So the question is, would the availability of such a dedicated stand to diabetes make a difference or is it just a, a peanuts what is being discussed yeah. here? Uh, you know, we, of course, if I want to go back, we need to remember that we need to control risk factors very well. So diabetes per se, not just diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, it has to be as low. And some diabetic medicine uh, will gives you better protection, cardiovascular uh, protection. So we need to remember this as a base. But uh, coming to stents, obviously stents, uh, you know, the architecture of the stents, the stent stiffness and so on, uh, thinness, strut thickness, plays a role. Uh, you must get as good results as possible. But, of course, if there is a stent, and if this stent uh, is, uh, has got um, features like what uh, Robert has uh, said, it will definitely be a boon. And if you can treat the vessel well with a proper device and then get the risk factors control, we hope that it will not come back, as has mentioned. It doesn't come back at the site that we treat itself, but also in other sites. Robert, great talk, as always. You're an impressive speaker. Uh, I took away two major things which make this stand unique absence of a polymer from one side and the fatty acid carrier on the other side. If you have to bet your 50 euros on which one of the two is driving the difference, what would you say? Is it the polymer or is it the, how do you call it, Trojan horse-like effect? Yeah, um, <coughs> it's, it's a good question. And I suppose there's a short answer and a long answer. I'll, I'll give you the short answer. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it's more to do with the fatty uh, acid uh, carrier that increases uh, the drug load in the cells. But we uh, did a lot of research with a variety of polymer-free coatings uh, during my time in Munich over the last 15 years. And uh, one trade-off was this uh, reduced efficacy. And here we have a polymer-free stent with enhanced efficacy. So I think that's the attractive element from a stent research point of view. Thank you very much. I would actually agree with you. I don't think the poor is such a bad thing. Rather, the fact that uh, serum concentration get twice higher inside the cell, it's probably much more important. Antonio, fr from a practical uh, standpoint, this stent uh, also is characterized by the markers. Uh, do you think is it relevant in 2022 to have markers, or is it still a sort of a carryover from the past? No, I, I think these are very visible markers, and uh, uh, not only when you have to do precise placement like osteal bifurcation, etc., but also when you have to do post dilatation, uh, being confident to be inside the stent to cover the stent through its entire length. Uh, I, I like them. I think the markers are uh, an important feature of this device. You, you, you spare a lot of radiation instead of the stand boost or clear way. I mean, you, you spare quite a lot of radiation just looking at the markers, right? <laughs> I, I, I mean, honestly, I don't know why other companies don't do the same. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. So. Rafael, you have a large experience with, with this stent because of the study that you're just right now is going to be presented to us, but also because we have been using the stent in, in your uh, practice for, for years. Uh, should we restrict the, this stent to uh, diabetic patients? Should we go diabetes patient? What is your practice with this stent? Robert did an amazing uh, presentation, and what he showed is that we are treating different diseases. So for diabetics, yes, we need this, this resistance, we need this increased fatty acid transportation, 
Uh, but f for patients without diabetes, they don't have this resistance. I think that the, the, the usual mechanism of transplantation should be okay. Uh, of course, CREATE has the efficacy and it also has another uh, properties, the lack of polymer, as you said, and very important is very thin device because it doesn't have the permanent polymer. So the total device thickness is 70 for the smallest 10 and 80, the total device thickness. For Onyx, for example, is 81 plus the polymer, so it's um, at the very end 90, 90, uh, 93. So for diabetics, of course, for non-diabetics, I think uh, it should perform comparable to the DS as the Recreate trial show. And uh, is a quick thought on carbon coating, does it also help a lot? Carbon coating at the end of the day has been used as a traditional way of covering the valves in the surgical area. So the stent is also carbon coated. Do you think that is also important? They have this trial that presented at PCR 2016 or 70, comparing the endotelization with bare metal stent. I think it was very good. Uh, I don't know if, may, if it makes the difference. The, of course, it's a different feature, but I don't know if it's that relevant uh, now that other stents had a really very compatible polymers. So at the end of the day, we have to buy the package. We don't know what yes. is doing what, but that's what it is. Uh, Dash, any uh, burning point that we need to discuss before we proceed? Not at the moment, thank you. Okay, so I think the audience then is going to explode because Rafael is going to not only present the data that we just saw presented before, but also some uh, new uh, information about the study. Thank you, Rafael. The podium is yours. That's a lot of pressure, Marco. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I do that with my fellows, so you're not my fellow, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, these are my disclosures. I modified my presentation the past Friday to include this case. Uh, this was performed in 2020 after the SUGAR trial was complete, the inclusion, at, in April. She was a 43 years old female with insulin dependent type 2 diabetes mellitus. She was admitted uh, due to acu acute coronary syndrome. And she has obesity with nearly 40 body mass index, 8% glycated hemoglobin. She was not taking the, the medications and she was only treated with insulin. She had in the coronary angio these two lesions on the LAD, the mid part of the LAD, a very long lesion, and one suboclusive on the right. As you can see here, the vessels are really, really small why these patients should have these small vessels. So we start doing OCT before PCI, and we saw that at the proximal part, she has a hypointense and without clear borders uh, plaque, suggesting lipidic plaque. And at the distal part, as you can see, the vessel is not that small indeed, but she has diffuse disease from the left main to the apex. So this is the problem. We are treating with different diseases. This is not a focal lesion that you have in a, in a normal patient without diabetes. They have resistance to sirolimus inhibitors. They have pro-inflammatory state, resistant to the APT drugs. And in addition, they have, because glycosylated, uh, glycosylation of uh, tyrosine kinase proteins, they have hyper uh, expression of these uh, proteins that make that uh, small vessel cells increase uh, the, um, the proliferation and the migration. So this is the reason we are treating different diseases. As you can see here, the vessel is as, it's not as you saw in the angio. The vessels are really large, but she has this diffuse disease. So my first message here will be these patients have different diseases and they cannot be treated as any other patient. We treat the patient with a long 2.5, 30, uh, 33 creativo with this result. And then on the right, we place a 2.25, 20. And the reason I include this case today is because on Friday, I was at the cat lab. The patient came because I did big chest pain. We did the angio and the stents were perfectly patent. Wow. So I said, this is a good case for, for PCR. We did OCT, we saw at the distal part that the create was perfectly endotelized without hyperplasia. As you can see here, you can differentiate the devices on the OCT because Sonix has round, small struts. Science has plain, small struts. And here on reservoirs, you can see the reservoirs, which are very wide, and here the connectors, which are very thin. Here we had a little bit of under expansion with a little bit of hyperplasia and very nice also proximal edge. 
we place this stent because we start uh, researching on this device in patients with diabetes in 2014 at the reservoir trial. This was a mechanistic trial. We show uh, we saw that the late loss in patients with diabetes was very low, 0.14, with a very thin standard deviation, which means that it's very predictable. You don't have uh, negative remodeling and positive remodeling occlusive stenosis. All the, val the values are very, very predictable, close to zero. For this reason, we designed the SUGAR trial, as you all may know, which randomized 1,170 patients with diabetes to create EVO or the permanent polymer resolutonics. We have also already presented one year data. The inclusion criteria was only to be a patient with diabetes mellitus and undergoing PCI, and there were very few exclusion criteria. So this trial represents an all-comer trial for patients with diabetes. All patients with diabetes could be included in this trial. As you can see here, the rate of crossover was very low, suggesting that the deliverability of both devices are really, really good. The baseline criteria, as you can see here, patients were mostly type 2 diabetes mellitus, uh, they were obese, they had a metabolic control close to what is recommended for patients with coronary artery disease, which is 7.5. 50% wet acute coronary syndrome and 50% were multivessel disease. The primary endpoint, digestion failure, was met at one year, showing a 35% reduction of events in the group of the creativo compared to the group of resolutonic. So it's a large reduction of events from 10.9 to 7.2 events. These differences were mainly driven by a reduction in target lesion revascularization. Also, a numerically lower rate of target vessel MI was also seen for, for CREATE EVO. So my second message here is CREATE EVO is superior to ONIX at one year. So this stand should be considered after this data as, the as a first line stand for patients with diabetes. Importantly, uh, the treatment with the APT was comparable between both groups at one uh, at baseline. The new DAPT drugs was a use was 50% according to the 50% rate of acute coronary syndromes, and we saw that in one year there were less patients in the creative well, uh, receiving the APT than in the Onyx which will suggest that because they have less events, the APT was taken off before than for the Onyx. As uh, Robert stated before, uh, if you have a TLR or TBR, you need to restart the APT. So as you can see here, this is data, this is new data, Marco, from the SUGAR trial. Patients having a TBR were were treated with the APT of 72.1% versus 27% patients without TBR. So patients free from, uh, free from events were mostly treated with single antiplatelet drug compared to patients that had a target visual revascularization that were mostly on the APT at one year. So my third message is in patients with high bleeding risk, especially in this set of patients, you need very potent DS. One may think, no, I'm going to implant a light DS so I can remove before the DAPT therapy. But the true thing is the opposite way. If you place a light DS, then you can have a higher rate of events. So the antithrombotic drug will need to be restarted again in a patient that cannot tolerate this treatment. Regarding the subgroup analysis, the effect of the CREATIVO was consistent according to the all subgroups. Patients with, as you can see here, with poor glycemic control was the same effect. Patients with obesity and complex lesions such as small vessel, long lesions, chronic kidney disease, or I tried, it was not included in the paper, for patients with high syntax score, there was also no interaction. So it was very consistent across the all subgroups. I try to look if the weight, the body mass index, the change in weight, the glycemic control were correlated to the events. And the true thing is that at one year there was a poor correlation. There was no effect of this metabolic control or weight in the rate of events at one year. The only two predictors of events at one year was 
uh, having a low LDL, according to the guidelines, and the use of modi uh, disease-modifying drugs that are recommended uh, now for patients with diabetes. So my fourth and last message is please treat patients rather than anatomies. We cannot focus on implanting good DS with IBUS, with, uh, with good technique of implantation, and then we forgot, like, like was the case of these patients, to use new drugs and to treat the LDL cholesterol because these are the two main predictors of event at one year. So to conclude, um, patients with diabetes mellitus have an specific metabolic traits and they should be treated accordingly. This is a different disease than patients with diabetes mellitus. Creativo is better than other polymer-based DS in all patients with diabetes, independently of the subgroup uh, analyzed, and they should be it should be considered as the first-line DS for this patient. Creativo is even more important if the patient with diabetes is at high risk of bleeding. So we can avoid the restart of new antiplatelet drugs. And PCI, finally, is a nonsense if we focus on anatomy and we forgot to treat the whole patient. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafael. You see, Antonio, the, the interventional cardiologist is getting wiser and wiser, eh? so we we'll think more about the patient than uh, stents or anatomy. So uh, uh, just a quick reaction from uh, you, Rosalie. You, you have seen the angio follow-up of this patient, virus with your angio follow-up. Do you, would you retrospectively go back to the patient and would perhaps uh, consider Creativo? Now we are in a sponsor session, so your answer is a bit forced <laughs> in one direction, but perhaps you can feel free to give an honest answer. Yeah, I, I would agree that uh, that would have been so. And, you know, at least perhaps uh, not giving him a, bet a better chance of not uh, coming back again. Now, obviously, uh, as we mentioned and discussed, that the other factors are very important as well. But if you have one stand that you want to choose, you may want to consider that, especially in diabetics who are not well controlled. Yep. I think so. Uh, to be honest, at the end of the day, it's, it's Thank the you for only stand. It in. It's the only stand <laughs> which showed an edge over the others in uh, this challenging uh, patient yeah. population. And then, uh, Rafael, going back to the data, 35% risk reduction does not mean much to me that I'm used to run studies, but the 3% up absolute risk difference yeah. means a number needed to treat of uh, 33, so which is quite quite a low. Means that every 33 patient you would treat with this stand instead of onyx, taking your data, you would avoid one TLF mainly. You would uh, avoid one revascularization. Clinically, it's something that you can perceive. You don't need to uh, treat hundreds of patients before you perceive the difference, right? Yes, indeed, it's, that's a lot of reduction. We designed the trial at the very beginning to look for non-inferiority at one year, but we end up with this superiority. And as you said, it's something that you perceive when you treat the patients. You see that you are using CREATE and the patients are not coming back due to, due to events. And many people looking for, uh, cons uh, trusting this high efficacy is even using that for in restenosis, very complex lesion, considering that the high amount of drug will be, will be very effective. One of the comments I heard the most from the people who wants to, in a way, put your study in a critical position is, yes, it's more efficacious, but yet they power the study for non-inferiority. So c can, you, can you elaborate on this? Uh, is it uh, okay to power the study for non-inferiority and then, if that is met, go for superiority? Is it something that is uh, acceptable? For me, it was acceptable. That's the reason we designed the trial. Uh, we don't need to adjust for multiple comparison because it's a sequential analysis. So the first has to be met to analyze the second. Of course, we need to wait for the two years and even for the longer follow-up because one year is, is very short follow-up. And the thing that we're looking is that mm, many patients start having angina at 10 months, then they go to their cardiologist, then stress test. So we designed the trial like this because we expect more events between year one and year two. That's the, that's the reason. So we should wait for the results. But I think that the results are talking by itself. I agree. Sometimes it's more challenging to power study for non-inferiority than superiority, so your study is perfectly okay following any possible guidelines or whatever uh, criteria for uh, statistical analysis interpretation of studies. Uh, last point I would like to discuss with you. Uh, I heard that comment already. Uh, yes, more efficacious, but the patient population was not that complex. You have 
See, you have shown the data about the Sinta score. Can you elaborate a little bit more? Because the median Sinta score was not that impressive. So why was it so? And whether you look into whether going up with the Sinta score, this delta between the two stands would remain the same. I think people are saying that, but we have 50% of patients with multivessel disease. 30% of patients with acute myocardial infarction with ST segment elevation. We have 3% rotablation, 5% left main stenosis. We have in stem rest stenosis included in the trial. We have some SVGs, so I think that the lesion complexity was high. Of course, the mean syntax score, the mean syntax score is in the lower tertile because the mean syntax score is for the whole population, not for the multi-vessel only group. So the 50% patients that has one vessel disease are also included in the mean syntax score. That's the reason it's low. And in addition, I think uh, we don't have to, to consider ourselves superheroes. So if the patient has a very high com complexity in multivessel disease, in our trial it was mandatory to ask for a cardiac surgeon to reject the patient. So probably yes, according to the guidelines, and I think what is better for the patient, many patients with multivessel disease and high complexity underwent surgery in our trial. I think it's a good point because we all have this tercile of the Sinta score trial in our mind because they were at the end of the day uh, embedded in the guidelines. But we should not forget that Sinta score was Sinta trial was done in patients with who were either three vessel disease or left main, not all cameras PCI. If you simply look at this mean Sinta score for an all camera PCI population, that's basically what you would see, the same number you have in your study. Plus the fact that diabetes per se is a factor to be taken into account when deciding upon type of revascularization. So you are completely right. Probably you simply follow good clinical practice. No, Antonio. It's interesting that in the Sinta trial, diabetes was not uh, a predictor of mm. events. This is a little bit uh, yeah. quite contradictory to... Yeah, I discussed that point with Patrick for uh, days, uh, and he claims that that was the case because the Sintas score would be able to quantify the CAD burden as such that would take the diabetes factor into account. Because if we just count the vessel, one, two, three, of course, it's not really a precise way of quantifying the atherosclerotic burden, but the Sinta score can go slightly beyond that paradigm. Having said that, this was not the case in Freedom. Uh, where the analysis was done and freedom did show superiority of CBG irrespective of Sinta score. Then the contentious discussion can uh, go away, can go, go forward, because in fact that Sinta score in freedom was post hoc. And uh, it's unclear who did what uh, with that uh, study. So, Robert, uh, I want to go back to you really with this point. Uh, when uh, we discuss patients in the R team, I guess beyond number of disease vessel beyond disease complexity, we have diabetes, yes or no, right? Which would push the patient towards surgery more than uh, towards us. Having a stent for the first time, and I want to remember this, having a stent for the first time showing a superiority in diabetic patient over another one at least, which is a good stent, Onyx, would that allow us to push a bit the envelope uh, slightly more by saying, yes, diabetes, okay, but I would implant creative stand. So why not just looking at the complexity of CAD per se and taking the diabetic factors away from the picture, as in a way Antonia was alluding to before? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a complica uh, complicated question, I think. Um, I suppose it might be a, a step too far uh, based on the data that we have at present. Uh, we have to look at uh, survival advantage of uh, surgery in patients who are at low surgical risk and have anatomy suitable for either PCI or cabbage. Uh, I mean, th those are the important caveats whenever we look at uh, trials like Freedom. But I think, uh, you know, Raphael reminded us we have to treat the patient. And uh, I think we're, we're treating the patient uh, with bypass surgery if it's appropriate uh, because of non-target lesion uh, reasons, if you want to phrase it like that. So for me, I mean, you take anatomic uh, complexity into account for sure. Uh, and uh, but, but diabetes is an important factor, realizing of course that diabetes is a binary classification as well which is somehow arbitrary and there's a spectrum of glucose tolerance that we don't factor into our decisions but I suppose we have to have some constructs uh, within to, uh, which to work otherwise uh, the heart team uh, meetings would descend into chaos.
Absolutely. I agree. Is there any comments, any yes. questions from the audience? Yes, we have one technical question, uh, which has to use the new study was, of course, performed with the new Creativo. But as I understand, um, there is still the older iteration, the Creative, available. Um, is there any efficacy or safety concern between the two stands? So the uh, prior iteration of the Create and the new Creativo. To the best of my knowledge, there isn't. Yeah, also because the stand is the same, right, unless I'm wrong. So it's a platform. Uh, so it's, the safety and efficacy is absolutely the same. Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of any uh, compelling uh, uh, data to say otherwise or, or direct comparison. Raphael, I don't know. Do you have anything on that? There's no direct comparison. We test both. Create all create in reservoir and new create in sugar and the efficacy was very high in both of them. What I can tell you is that the, with the new creativo the flexibility is much higher. It's like incredible comparable to the to the previous one, which was kind of uh, kind of stuck. And the other difference is the angiographic uh, uh, image of the stand, because on the previous one, uh, you, when you are implanting a science or a resolute, all the all the struts have the same size. Of course, the same alloy, so the radiopacity is the same. But for create, you have reservoirs which are very wide and connectors that are very thin. So. In the Anjo, you can see some uh, differences between the, the, plat the, the, the zones of the stand because it's the same alloy, of course, but the radio opacity is also marked by, by the strut wide and the strut thickness. And this is the reason. And for creativo, because the elements are smaller and, and put it uh, more closer, uh, in this case, you, you, this, this image is disappeared. So you can see a more homogeneous stand because the, the things are smaller. Thank and, you, Rafael, for this. And question. also, you have a much wider range um, in terms of length with the new Creative, or all the way up to 46 per, uh, millimeters, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> uh, Antonio, I want you to have the final word here. And uh, where, where should we go now with this stand uh, technology? Where, where uh, would you advise uh, the company to go ahead? Uh, so the, the, the study is actually coming from Rafael and the company has been uh, taking advantage from the study, no, from one, one side. So what would be ne the next step for, from the company? Would you, would you rather see a larger at what study with another DS to make the study even more compelling, assuming they're not already? I think they are, but let's assume they're not. Or would you rather say, look, I don't want to go stand A versus B. I'm fed up with this study. Let's again try to get engaged in a battle with surgeons. In, in order uh, to go into the guidelines, uh, that which is uh, ultimately our goal, uh, is uh, to set uh, a study for superiority, where superiority is the primary uh, endpoint from the very beginning. I, you know, the problem of diabetes is so immense that can. I mean, congratulations uh, to uh, Rafael, uh, to all the Spanish, but it's so immense that we really need uh, a very, very large multicentric study, many countries, many patients, uh, because uh, uh, it's, uh, it's really needed. But that, that means, Antonio, that even ability global, 3,000 patients would not be enough. They are still power for non-inferiority, with the potential to go for superiority if non inferiority is met. So that study basically is, is not existing then. Uh, you know, in, uh, uh, we know in the medical literature how many times uh, a single study was then disproven by other studies, uh, even very reputable uh, single studies. The New England Journal of Medicine is full uh, of reports that has been disproven a uh, few years later. Thank you, Antonio. So confirmation matters. I do agree with you. It's now time to wrap up uh, quickly uh, the session, which I think was a very important session with a lot of in discussion and wonderful presentations. So let, let me thank the speakers and the discussion now and you, of course, for the participation. The key learnings, I, at least I add from this session, is that every single diabetic patient with MBD, with multivessel disease, needs to be discussed in the heart team. 
uh, and as well as involving the patient, which is perhaps even more important than discussing among us, assessing the merits and the limits of surgery versus uh, PCI. FFR-based uh, lesion selection in all stable lesion, and I would like to underline stable because we don't have evidence otherwise, is key to minimize unnecessary uh, stenting. Intravascular imaging has been discussed that has potential to further optimize the outcome uh, of our intervention. And it's true, especially for diabetes, that not DES have been created equal. That's one of the very few times in which we do see one stand standing out, but we are standing a few millimeters off the patient. And of course, uh, glycemic control and metabolic control remains of paramount be beyond what we do and how uh, what we do. We've seen what makes Creativo uh, unique. It's not only the absence of the polymer, it's the capability of having this uh, acid, acid uh, carrier, which is increasing the capability of cellulomus to entering the cell, which is very important because you may recall from the history that they uh, tried to uh, simply double or even make the dose of cellulomus three times without any carrier, and that led to more toxicity more than to more efficacy. We have seen the data from sugar, uh, the nothing new here that has been presented by Rafael as well, but let me reinforce what Rafael has presented uh, just recently uh, now in his presentation. Here we have a wonderful combination between higher efficacy and higher safety. The efficacy comes, of course, from less in stent stenosis, so decreased intimiperplasia, and the safety comes from the fact that not having a patient coming back for a TVR, DPT can ought, should not be reinstituted. That would translate long-term into a lower beating the form or safety. I think for today it's all. Uh, we would like to have next year the launch of a huge study to make sure that we can progress in this very challenging patient population. Thank you very much for listening and attending the session.